The following presentation was recorded at the 2017 ANZIC's Safety and Quality Conference. Right, uh, so thank you very much, Sam. As I say, I'm not sure I'm going to be telling you everything about junior medical training, but uh, perhaps a little bit of insight from the Australian Capital Territory. So I, I thought just useful to know where we've come from in terms of the challenges that uh, have been set ahead of us, the potential solutions, and you know, has that actually have an impact on patient outcome and uh, patient process? It's all very well putting education programs in, but actually does it have any effect at all on the actual patient themselves? I always wonder whether we actually collect enough data to suggest that. So as we all know, the recognition and response to patient deterioration is a complicated process and involves a huge number of people, not least uh, nursing staff, allied health, and doctors. And as you will note, uh, in this, certainly in my own environment, uh, that the doctor will be spoken about uh, abnormal vital signs, and in some respects they will need to interpret that phone call to actually go to the ward, and then when they go to the ward, they need to interpret what they see in front of them and then make appropriate management decisions. So there is a lot of input from the doctor. Now, it just so happens that patient deterioration will probably occur 70% out of hours. That's because the week, if you look at it from a Monday through to the Sunday night, is in fact 70% of it is out of hours. So you're very at the behest of a junior doctor. So it's always good to arrive into hospital Monday to Friday, 8 till 6. And outside of those hours, you are then exposed to the inexperienced uh, clinical decision maker. So that's why it's reasonably helpful to uh, help your junior doctors know what it's all about. So uh, Peter Garling in his report highlighted the issue that it was really clinical or junior clinicians out of hours that were the, the, the challenge in that they were inexperienced and often reluctant to call their consultant. So it's a, a not only an educational issue, it's a clinical experience issue, but it's also a hierarchical issue. So I, really what I'm going to say to you is that education is probably a small part of helping patients get the right treatment at the right time. Now, New South Wales' response to the Garling Report was that uh, certainly healthcare professionals, and in that would be junior doctors, needed uh, systems and training programs that were about patient deterioration. And of course, we know that the Clinical Excellence Commission was already doing some work on patient deterioration, and now what we know is between the flags. So education was coming up as something to do in terms of fixing the problem that we were facing in public hospitals in terms of patient deterioration. And then indeed last year there was a release of a report looking at what was required for a junior doctor as soon as they were leaving the university environment. We just heard a little bit about the university environment. And are we actually producing doctors that are appropriately skilled to start with? And one of the things that they highlighted with a clinical skill that you needed as you graduated was the ability to assess undifferentiated uh, and be able to recognize deteriorating patients. So again, being highlighted as an issue for junior doctors as they graduate from their university. And then, of course, the commission, uh, just prior to that, uh, highlighted the issue of what was needed to have an appropriate uh, recognition and response system to patient deterioration. And it wasn't just one thing, it was a sort of suite of things that you would need to allow your patients to get appropriate care. And education, again, was brought up as something that would be part of the framework to get you uh, recognized and responded well to patients that are deteriorating. But in the body of work that I did as part of my PhD, really, if we look at what was really needed and what it was that came down to is it, and it's not rocket science after I trawl through thousands of words of uh, interviews, was that you actually need timely and appropriate clinical decision making. And the difficulty with that is that you need lots of inputs to allow you to get to the right decision at the right time. And through all these focus groups that I held, not one person mentioned education. So in their eyes, both junior doctors, senior doctors, and nurses at the bedside were not highlighting education as one of the major features of allowing people to rightly make a clinical decision. And what would influence clinical decision making would be that if one of you suddenly dropped down to the floor, you would hope that no one would hesitate and actually resuscitate you appropriately. So that in of themselves, a disease actually prompts you to do something. 
Whereas if there wasn't something sudden, people would be a bit more hesitant, have I got the right diagnosis, etc. Then of course, and I think this for me is a real issue, is the, uh, the depth and breadth of clinical experience. I think as junior doctor hours have become less, and the uh, doubling of medical graduates so that each doctor is actually looking after less patients for less hours, the exposure that you get to a patient deterioration is very small. So if you think about it in my own hospital, we have something like 2,000 met calls. There are 600 junior doctors. They are not going to see patient deterioration very often. Uh, so I think we've got to think about this in terms of clinical experience. And does education sort of bridge the gap between clinical experience and, uh, and actually trying to get to the right decision at the right time. We've talked a little bit about, just in the prior talk, about communication skills and how good are we at communicating. We, at medical school, certainly, we teach a lot about talking to patients. It may not be very obvious when people graduate, but that's certainly what we teach them a lot of. We teach very, very little about interprofessional speaking and certainly doctor-to-doctor -doctor upper hierarchy. You know, we just recently were starting to do that a little bit more in our own medical program at the ANU. And then, of course, uh, your supervising consultant, are they supervising you? Are they at home and you're too fearful to call for help? Uh, and then, of course, the way you're rostered will depend on how much then clinical experience you get. So all of these factors really lend them to sales. Education may not just be the whole answer. And indeed, if you look at the patient safety literature, education is very low down on the effectiveness of a patient safety strategy. So training and supervision uh, is very low, as I say, in how effective you will be in terms of trying to improve patient safety. So I think I'm not trying to damn education because obviously I'm passionate about education, but all I'm saying is only one part of the solution. And so as a response to this sort of ever burden of patient deterioration becoming an issue, and I think particularly as we'd many of us had installed a MET system, but it's still we were finding challenges on the ward. Patients were still deteriorating, and yet there was still a problem with the MET not fixing everything. And was it because, in fact, our ward staff weren't measuring and documenting vital signs, the junior doctors were unable to interpret what they were seeing, uh, and then eventually someone would be brave enough to call for a MET. So there was obviously an issue in terms of certainly people understanding what they were looking at. And so there have been programs that have been set up to address these issues. And obviously our one in the ACT is Compass, and that's news now uh, internationally as well as nationally but also the UK with their alert program and obviously the New South Wales Detect program for the Between the Flags. So I'm, and I'm sure there are many, many more, but they're really trying to address the issue probably one uh, step behind the MET system and advanced life support and resuscitation. It's about the ward environment and what you do on the ward environment. So we just focus on Compass a little bit. So when we're certainly teaching the junior doctors, the curriculum that we have, I suppose, is a spiral curriculum from the undergraduate program. So at least 75% of our junior doctors have come from the ANU, so it's quite easy to do that building blocks of a spiral curriculum. We are really teaching the fundamental principles. We don't go into in-depth management because we believe that's probably already been addressed. It's just trying to join up the dots in terms of you know, immediately resuscitating your patient, recognizing what the problem is, and then, trying to, then you'd work out what the treatment was needed. And obviously for our curriculum, we've got some learning outcomes. The delivery is multimodal, so um, this is, you know, we designed this, I think, uh, 10 years ago now. We had our birthday not so long ago. But uh, I suppose we were a little bit ahead of ourselves in terms of it's a digitally, digitally enhanced uh, learning program so that there is some interaction and some feedback. There's also the passive uh, reading material that I guess you could, like, it could be a bit like the flipped classroom. They're meant to do the work before they come into the low fidelity case-based simulation. And there's obviously an interactive lecture to lead into these uh, simulation uh, cases. And the cases themselves are interprofessional. Now, whilst we may not have all the uh, various um, professions there, we at least act uh, and understand what the role of each of the nurse and the doctor should be. And I think importantly, it was alluded to a little earlier, is it's not just about learning about the physiology. It is actually about learning about teamwork and how we need to communicate with each other and what's important at that time. And then, as I say, we go more into depth in physiology to try and understand whereabouts does that patient deterioration come into a problem and then how might we fix it. So, as I say, it's not only about the sort of uh, clinical material, but it's also about the teamwork as well. 
And so our aim of Compass is to actually allow all healthcare professionals, so it's not just the junior doctors that we focus on particularly because we realize that a ward environment is an interdisciplinary team effect. Uh, and then we'll hopefully we'll allow people to recognize their patients that are deteriorating. We'll get at least the initial interventions started and that they be timely and not this sort of spinning around, as Michael Buse has talked about, the clinical cycle of futility. They're kind of doing stuff, but not really doing stuff. And in only talking to some junior doctors last week, is that uh, you know, people will order chest x-ray, they'll order a blood gas, they'll order an ECG, but all feeling like they're doing something, and yet actually they're not treating the patient who's just drowning in pulmonary edema. So the learning outcomes, as I said before, are sort of uh, given to the, the junior doctors, um, but it is about understanding how a blood pressure might be generated and how that might be interrupted, and then what an abnormal one might mean in terms of the actual effect it has on the patient. But we also broaden out the education in terms of clinical material, also to teamwork, communication, and actually building the plans together. Um, Simon Finfer, in a previous session, talked about you know, how many of us prescribe an antibiotic and never actually watch it being given. That's probably because we're not then perhaps communicating effectively to the, whoever's actually going to be administering it. So it's very important that when you're starting things, you're actually going to allow the other person to take up the realm when you've disappeared. Now, that, that Sam also alluded to is that the pragmatics of teaching junior doctors. Uh, as with medical students, you've got a captive audience because they've actually got to be there, but in fact, junior doctors don't necessarily have to be there. It's very hard to mandate training. And in fact, as soon as you mandate it, people don't want to do it. And so the challenge that we have is a junior doctor is incredibly time poor. And so they might see it in the calendar, but then in fact, they get called away. And it's really hard to have protected time. And the other problem that we will face is, well, why do I need to do it? Because I've already done it before. Uh, it's not particularly exciting. It's a bit repetitive. And what's the benefit for me? No one actually thinking that this is the benefit for the patient, uh, should that be a surprise to us all. And then there seems to be a bit of dissonance between reality, what actually happens at the bedside, uh, and then what the junior doctors might be telling us. So in a recent review of our own MET system in Canberra, there was a quote from a junior doctor, or at least that they are widely, they are able to deliver appropriate care to deteriorating patients. I guess that quote could be, uh, you, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So I was a little bit uh, disheartened to think that the junior doctors in my hospital believe that they can deliver appropriate care. Well, maybe our education is so fabulous that they're all okay, but I guess I know from practical experience it's not okay at all. So these are all challenges that we face when we're trying to educate our junior doctors. But when we do manage to get them into cohorts, and often it happens at orientation, that's probably the most if effective use of our time is in terms of orientation. They're new and uh, they've got their, certainly interns is one week prior to starting their own uh, clinical job. And obviously new doctors coming into our environment also have their orientation time as well. So we grab those opportunities. Our learning outcomes are broadly the same. What we will do is then adjust who we're teaching in terms of the case-based scenarios. So if it's an intern, it'll be about you know, recognizing then what initial treat. If it's registrars, it's, it's more about uh, you know, what management should I give in what situation. So as I say, it builds upon prior learning. And we adjust the, the teaching according to the level of clinical experience. So the interns will still get the full compass, and that is that they will be expected to read, answer the, the quiz, and then they will expect to attend the four case scenarios that we deliver uh, at orientation. Now, for those students who've been through our system already, so all the ANU students will have been through compass, we then change all the cases so that it's not the same. Now, registrars and residents, we have to be more pragmatic. We realize that they're not going to come, so at least we get out an interactive lecture based around the, the one that we would give in the full compass. And then, <clears throat> obviously, as I say, we adjust our timing because of, you know, residents and registrars don't have much uh, to give us. So since 2007, we've uh, educated uh, over 1,000 junior doctors. Um, obviously, at least half of those are the interns, and we hope that then will promulgate through the system so that when they're registrars, they've already learned what they're supposed to know. So does it actually have an effect on patient outcome? 
Well, certainly in terms of process, you can see the number of MET calls has gone up in our own organization. We're up to at least 2,000 a year. And the number that we have a delayed activation in the ward environment is the blue line. So we use an early warning score system. So the number of delays has gone down prior to a MET. And also the delayed METs have also gone down. Now, that's not saying education is, is the only solution here, but it's certainly been part, a strong part of our implementation of patient safety around patient deterioration. And then for what it's worth, uh, I mean, there's no statistics in this whatsoever, but I thought the line looked uh, sort of convincing in the right direction. So our standardized mortality ratio for the hospital appears to have come down over time. So in conclusion, uh, there are many rec recommendations to train junior doctors. So lots of reports saying that junior doctors must be educated. Um, but I would stress to you that education is only one part of the solution. Uh, we personally have used a curriculum that has really spiraled from the undergraduate through to the postgraduate. Uh, but again, we have to adapt it according to our environment. So if you don't have much time, at least do something that will allow them to recognize and respond appropriately. Um, and then I think it's not only about the clinical material, but it's also about building upon teamwork and communication. Thank you.